everybody. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, it's particularly heroic to don masks at lunchtime and uh, um, come to discuss important issues in the middle of, uh, of everybody's busy life. And we're so thrilled that you're here. My name is Anat Admati. Um, I am a finance and economics professor here and the head director of the Corporation Society Initiative, Cassie. Cassie is now starting its fourth year and, and we engage in issues in, in the intersection of markets, business, government, and society to promote good governance and accountability. We undertake a bunch of activities to advance uh, this cause with different communities in GSB, much beyond at Stanford and beyond that in the world, in the world of policy and media, et cetera. We think governance problems are at the heart of much of what goes on and we think that's most important to and most challenging to figure out. We are a collaboration of faculty, staff and students. So we have student leaders, a few of them are here. One of them is gonna moderate this debate, Sarah Johnson, and uh, another one is gonna moderate the uh, online participants, Matt Devine, and we have a few others. We have a few exciting events. This happens to be concentrated week with three events and they are all uh, awesome. We have cybersecurity tomorrow in the corporate world and Representative Rokana on Friday, and then another one next week. Um, I'm gonna, without further ado, I'm gonna let Sarah introduce our speakers. These are uh, Stanford colleagues, uh, two or three authors, all of whom uh, are affiliated with Cassie. We share a lot of uh, interest. They teach a very important course at Stanford and have written a very important book. I just got my first uh, autograph of it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thanks for, for making it today. We're really excited to, to have everyone here, uh, to have these wonderful people here with us. I think it's a really important discussion, particularly at the GSB. Uh, we all know we're going to go on to hopefully be leaders, or so we're told, uh, in a lot of different fields, including a lot of people into to tech in particular, as well as government. I think this is particularly important for us to be discussing. So I'm excited to announce or introduce our, our two speakers. Uh, first, we have Mehran Sahami. Uh, he's one of the best known CS professors at Stanford, uh, teaches the infamous CS106A, which I have many friends who have, who have gone through. Uh, he was also an early member of Google, worked as a research scientist there, uh, and is a member of several VCs, as well as an advisor to a number of startups. We also have Jeremy Weinstein. He's professor of political science, uh, a fellow at FSI right across the street, director of the Global Studies Division and African Studies here at Stanford. He was Director for Development and Democracy on the National Security Council under Obama, starting in 2009, and also Chief of Staff, then Deputy to Samantha Power when she was UN ambassador to the, sorry, US Ambassador to the UN. So we're very excited. Um, in terms of agenda today, uh, I'm gonna hand the floor over to the two of them to discuss for 20 or 30 minutes. Uh, then I'll kick us off for, with a few questions and open it up for, for Q&A from all of you. Great. So it's so great to be with you today. Thanks, Anat, for inviting us and Sarah for introducing us. We're going to speak for no more than 20 minutes just to set the table for today's conversation. Uh, but really, especially in this environment, especially at Stanford Business School, given the role of Stanford Business School in shaping the tech ecosystem as well, we're really excited for the conversation that we can have with you about the issues that are raised in the book. I'm going to start by providing a little bit of the motivation for writing the book. Maren's going to tell you about the architecture of the arguments in the book, and I'll end with a few comments on how we think about the solution space related to the issues that we raise. So about five years ago, Maron, Rob, and I, three faculty members, one, the superstar computer science professor, one, a philosopher, Rob, who's not with us, he's off pondering philosophical questions at the airport, uh, and then myself, the political scientist, social scientist, policymaker came together because we were deeply concerned about the trajectory of Silicon Valley and the intertwining of Stanford's story and Silicon Valley's story in a way that was insufficiently self-reflective and critical about what was unfolding all around us. This was after Cambridge Analytica. This was in the context of the 2016 election. And I think increasingly at that moment, 
the bloom had come off the rose of Silicon Valley. If you look back at the period that predated that moment and think about how it played out on this campus where all of us were, it was a moment where you could get fabulously wealthy and make everyone in the world better off at the same time. And the path to doing that was to join tech companies. So to develop your skills, the 21st century superpowers of data science, computation, computer programming, and you could go to companies that offered you the promise of sitting in your bedroom, in your pajamas, writing lines of code, making everyone better off, and then exiting just in time to buy anything that you'd ever wanted. And I think this sort of momentum and, and mindset that was emerging on campus and that we saw more broadly, this uncritical acceptance of the mission statements of tech companies, this blindness to the potential harmful consequences of tech, this lack of attention to who might not be benefiting in this current moment was what got the three of us thinking about where we could intervene on campus in this pipeline into tech to create a context in which some of the hard questions about technology, about its benefits, about its potential harms, about the values that are encoded in technology could actually be engaged. And so the three of us spent a year thinking together, which meant reading about some of the frontier issues in technology, sort of giving Maron a lot of reading from law review journals. Maron was giving us readings from the you know, ACM, you know, computer science, machine learning, you know, conferences to help develop a common language. And we felt that the three perspectives that we had were actually the intersection that needed to exist in the world. That is, you needed the ability to understand the technical foundations of new technologies to understand where values were actually being encoded. Then you needed a normative perspective because when you get into a space of discussions about values, you need to understand what values are being traded off against one another. If we are in a moment where we are maximizing access to data because of all of its benefits, why would you ever think that we care about privacy, right? What is the normative underpinnings for attention to that value that might be traded off? And then you needed a social science and a policymaking perspective to think about how do you referee value trade-offs? And how you referee value trade-offs is fundamentally an issue of politics, right? And it's an issue of the legitimate domains in which we referee these value trade-offs. And then questions about what are the kind of policy and regulatory interventions that might actually help us achieve a better balance of these values. And so for the last four years, we've been teaching this course together. We have about 300 students a year, mostly computer scientists. We got interest from Silicon Valley that said, come share what you're teaching you know, in the evening with professional technologists. So we launched a partnership with Bloomberg Beta and the city, and we began to teach professional technologists in the evening. And then we decided that this was really a conversation that needed to involve not only technologists, right, but citizens more broadly. And the best idea that we had for how to start engaging citizens more broadly was to write a book that actually people who are not in our fields might want to read. So it's readable, it's got stories, it's got anecdotes, it's got a narrative art. The idea being we need to energize people who don't see themselves as having a role in shaping our technological future to care and get out of the passive orientation that the future that we have is going to be written by the technologists. And so that's what brings us to the book. So thanks, Jeremy. Um, am I on? You're not on. Yeah, you are. I am. Maybe I just need to move this up a little bit. Can you hear me? All right. Um, so part of the reason we wrote the book is, is exactly that notion that in developing technology, there's not only certainly positive effects, and those have been on display for quite a while, but there's also negative externalities. And we need to be aware of what those negative externalities are. At the same time, we didn't want to write a polemic. We didn't want to write, you know, it's a dystopian world where technology takes over and up of those books have been written. And we didn't want to write a book that says technology is going to solve all the problems of the world and up of those have been written. And neither one of them, we think, really hits the point, which is that there's something in the middle which says there's real benefits of technology, but at the same, same time, there's harms. And unless we take a realistic view about both, we don't fully understand the whole situation. And so that was really the reason to write the book. And part of the way we start the architecture of the book is to think about the systematic drivers for these problems. So the story of Silicon Valley is not a story of good people or bad people or good companies or bad companies. 
It's a story to think that there's a bunch of systematic drivers that over and over create a particular set of situations that lead to the kind of externalities we've seen. And if we can unpack what some of those things are, then maybe we can find pragmatic ways to harness the benefits of technology while also finding reasonable ways to be able to mitigate some of the effects. So we start off the first section of the book looks at these systematic drivers. We start with something called the optimization mindset, which is, an op which is a mindset that's clearer in computer science and more generally in engineering, which is the desire to want to be able to optimize some quantity or some metric. And in business, that becomes a very driving force for a lot of companies, right? Whether or not you call them KPIs or OKRs or whatever your favorite acronym is, there are things we want to measure about our business because that's how we determine how we're doing. And we want to optimize those things. So we want to do as well on those things as we can. And if we can bring technology to bear on those problems, all the better. And part of the problem is the things that you can measure that oftentimes in a business are measured are things that are easy to measure, not necessarily the things that actually matter, right? Kind of like the classic saying goes. Let me give you a simple example. Facebook's stated mission is to connect the world. Well, how do you measure connecting the world, right? Well, the way they measure it, a bunch of things like how much time people spend on platform, how much they click through on content, how many times they engage with something like clicking the like button, or if it makes you happy or angry or in love or whatever the case may be. The problem is those are poor proxies for measuring connection in the world, because I might engage with a piece of content because it infuriates me. I might engage with a piece of content because I find it titillating in some way. That doesn't necessarily mean I'm getting more engagement in the world. It just means I'm interacting with content. But if I have that proxy and that's how I think about the world, that's what I optimize. The second driver is taking that notion and pushing it out at scale. This one of the things we certainly see in Silicon Valley, we certainly see it in the venture capital community, which is the notion of getting big fast, right? Sometimes people refer to this as blitz scaling. And it's the notion that we want to get these drivers up as high as possible. We want hockey stick growth. And so what that doesn't leave time for is a lot of time to reflect on what are the negative externalities that are generated by that technology? What are some of the things that are not being measured by the things that we're trying to optimize? What does that actually mean for us? And then the third systematic driver is actually a lack of something. It's actually a deliberate indifference of politicians. So it turns out back about 25 years ago in the mid 1990s, the Clinton Gore administration wanted to help the internet take off. Remember Al Gore invented the internet, right? So the way they did that was they created a regulatory oasis around big tech. And we got things like the Communications Decency Act of 1996 and section 230, which is the one that's now hotly sort of talked about in the press, which created a regulatory oasis of liability around these companies that said, you're not liable for the information that gets posted on the platforms, assuming good faith efforts to take down like bad information, okay? That was great at the time. It actually helped the internet take off. At the same time, we also had a rollback of restrictions around commercial trade on the internet. So help the internet grow. It was fantastic for its time to accomplish what it needs to do. But 25 years later, when sort of these negative externalities are on full display, we live in the same regulatory regime that allows for no guardrails in the system. And so that's where we get into what are some of the problems then, once we sort of have some of these systematic drivers, what are the different areas where we see problems? There's lots, we identify four big ones in the book. The first one has to do with uh, algorithmic decision-making, which is the fact that more and more important decisions in our lives are actually being made by algorithms. Like in finance, who gets access to credit, who gets a mortgage in the criminal justice system, who gets out on bail, in healthcare, who gets access to healthcare and what kind of healthcare they get access to in our dating lives, like when you swap love or uh, switch love to right, right. swap. Um, who, yeah, I don't date anymore, I'm sorry. My, my wife is happy about that, I think. Um, but, you know, who you get matched with. So significant portions of our lives are being decided by algorithms. Oftentimes, these algorithms are trained using machine learning, which is looking at for finding historical patterns in data. And so if that data incorporates biases in it of human decision making, which oftentimes it does, that pattern becomes encoded in an algorithm. And so under the guise of being objective, because decisions are being made by an algorithm, all we've done is taking a pattern of bias in the past, encoded it, and now executed it at scale. Right, which means the problems get even worse. So we look at some of those issues and then we talk about, well, what, is, what does lack of bias mean? What is fairness all about? Like, how do you even define that as a difficult problem, especially when you need to define it precisely to optimize an algorithm for it? 
From there, we get into issues of data privacy and data maximization. So in the business world, one common thing, especially when people are starting companies, is gather all the data you can because you don't know what you're going to need later. Well, gather all the data you can. You could also interpret that as violate as much privacy as you can because it's the same thing, right? Because there's a trade-off between the data you gather and how much personal privacy someone has. And those are the issues we go into. What, are, what is the value of privacy and what are the trade-offs that exist? And technology is not neutral. I say that as a technologist. So you can look at a piece of technology and say, well, it's just how it's used. Let me give you an example of technology not being neutral. Encryption. Encryption technology is wonderful for privacy. We can build messaging apps like Signal or WhatsApp that are end-to-end -end encrypted, which means no one gets to see that message from, except the person who sent it and the person who received it. That also means that if the person who sent it and the person who received it are doing child trafficking, no one can see that information. So there's a trade-off there, right? It puts a thumb on the scale of privacy, but at the same time, other values we might care about like security get denigrated as a result. And if we don't think about those trade-offs and blindly pursue particular technology and push it to its extreme because we're trying to optimize it at scale, that's what we're doing is tipping the balance of these value trade-offs. That's one of the things we try to raise in the book. From there, we get into notions of AI and automation. And Automation is a wonderful thing. My PhD thesis was in machine learning and AI. I'm not saying this as someone who thinks it's a bad thing, but what we need to understand with it is if this is coming, it's going to lead to some pretty significant labor displacement. Depending on who you talk to, the estimates right now are between 9% and 47% of the labor force will be impacted by automation in the next 10 years. So we're not talking about 50 years out. We're talking 10-year time horizon. Well, if we see this kind of thing coming, what can we do about it? What should our response be? We don't want to wait until the unemployment rate doubles or triples. We need to think about things like education and job reskilling now and think about how those policies get enacted and who's responsible for them and how they get funded to deal with the implications for job displacement in the future. And then the last issue we get into is probably the, the biggest one, which is the notion of free speech and impact of that speech on democracy on online platforms, right? So we saw the impacts in terms of misinformation and disinformation in the 2016 election. We saw its impact in leading up in the January 6th insurrection in this country. We saw its impact in the Brexit election in the UK. More and more, there are interests who want to use these platforms as a megaphone to be able to amplify misinformation under the heading of free speech. And so the flip side of that value trade-off is, well, there's a real value in free speech. We want to allow people to be able to say what they want. But are there lines that you draw when that speech becomes dangerous, when it becomes harassing, when it misinforms an electorate? Those are the issues that we need to grapple with. So that kind of sets the architecture for the kinds of things we, we talk about in terms of topics in the book. I'll give it back over to Jeremy in terms of where we think about solution now. So for the final few minutes before we open it up to you, you know, one of the motivations for writing the book was our recognition or sense that looking out at the world, looking out at technologists, looking out at consumers, looking out at citizens, that there's a profound sense of apathy and passivity about the relationship between technology and, and society. That somehow technology's effects on all of us are preordained or fixed, right? They're determined by technologists hidden behind walls, and there's nothing that we can do about them. And I think at the core of the teaching that we've been doing, but also at the core of the book and the outreach that we've been doing is just to reclaim our agency in this space. That the effects of technology are not preordained or fixed. They're a function of what we build, how we design it, how that technology interacts with human beings, and what guardrails we set in place as a society to mitigate the harms of technology. And so the moment that we're in is not some predestined path we're on, but one that we can really shape and change. Now, of course, in the way that we relate to technology as consumers, we're often given a binary choice, right? You can use Google for search and accept the monetization of your personal data and the advertising that goes along with it and the reading of your Gmail account and the like. You can use Uber and accept the way in which Uber treats its workers and, and doesn't provide for some of the basic workplace safety and, and, and sort of social safety net kinds of benefits. Or you can just not use these technologies. And, and that is the framework that many people have had on the tech sector up until the present. 
that we preserve for ourselves agency over these technologies, you can just walk away from them. Like walk away from Zoom in the midst of the pandemic because you don't like its privacy policy or walk away from Google, which has 90 plus percent of the global search market or walk away from the one social media platform on which all of your friends and family members have an account, right? So there's a fiction that is embedded in these binary choices. And there's also a view that somehow it's on us as consumers uh, just to really walk away from the harms if we're concerned about them, as if somehow that resolves the social effects of these technologies, which of course it doesn't. And so in the same way that we begin the book with a focus on the systemic drivers of these problems, we also focus on the systemic solutions, right? And in that sense, we begin with kind of the metaphor of the road system, right? You get a new technology like a car, which is pretty awesome. It enables you to move a lot faster than the horse and the buggy, right? Um, but you don't sort of give everyone a car and say, figure it out on the road, right? Like drive as fast as you want. Drive on the left-hand side, drive on the right-hand side, right? Don't stop for anyone if you're in a rush. But we set in place a bunch of guardrails around that technology, right? We begin to create lanes, stoplights, stop signs, yield signs, speed bumps, right? All of the architecture, you could call that regulation. It has a bad, you know, sort of association with it, especially out on the West Coast. But these kinds of guardrails underlie just about every market in which we exist. But for the reasons that Maron described, we haven't had any of these guardrails underlying technology, or at the very least, very minimal guardrails. And so in the end of the book, in addition to discussing some of the kind of point solutions around data privacy, around content moderation, like all of the issues of the present moment, um, where there are legislative ideas that are out there that need to be vetted and, and thought through, we also focus on three more systemic plays to address this reality that technology's social harms are apparent and not adequately addressed. The first is the need to cultivate an ethic of responsibility among computer scientists and in the tech sector. And we tell the story about the transformation of medicine, the shift from quackery to a regulated industry where you trust that your medical provider has your best interests at heart, that they're held accountable for upholding particular standards of care, and that ultimately whatever medical devices you're using or medicines you're ingesting have been held to a standard where we understand their benefits and harms. And so what does, it, what does it mean to look at the role of computer science in society with some of those lessons of the transformation that happened in medicine, the transformation that happened in law? The second part of the story is about addressing the concentration of power that exists in a small number of tech companies and how that concentration of power is basically standing in the way of addressing a lot of these social harms. And obviously part of the response to that concentration of power relates to the debates about antitrust that are now playing out in Washington and where you've seen antitrust action by the Europeans for a number of years. But we also talk about the movements that are afoot within these companies to change the companies from below, right? That reclaiming of agency among workers who say, I'm not comfortable with Google using the technologies that I'm building for this end use or for in this country context or with this particular partner. And that kind of mobilization that we're seeing inside companies is hugely important because these companies, as all of you know better than us, are in a desperate race for talent, right? And their the reputational consequences or their failure to create environments which are actually conducive to attracting the talent they need is probably their most existential threat. And then the final piece of the puzzle relates to the regulatory landscape. And though, of course, there are point-specific solutions on all these issues that, that Maron briefly mentioned, algorithmic auditing, you know, oversight and transparency around algorithmic amplification on, on the social media platforms, data privacy protections and the like. The biggest issue that we confront is that we do not have a democracy that is capable of governing technology. And so while we might be able to come out of the policy window that we're in with some pieces of legislation that are bipartisan and that address the problems of the last 10 years, what are we going to do about the problems of the next 10 or 15 years? And how do we avoid a situation in which disruption continues to outpace democracy? And the reason that we end with that is because democracy is our technology for refereeing value trade-offs. 
This actually is the, the organizational structure that we have selected in the United States and in other countries around the world for dealing with those situations where values are being traded off and there is no right answer. And when people have different preferences and different views, we have to engage them politically. And so this means thinking about how we attract tech talent into government, how we provide the kind of oversight bodies that are needed that can provide our elected politicians with an independent view on frontier technologies and their effects rather than relying on the information that's provided by lobbyists, which is the primary source of information on technical issues. And it also means thinking about how we adopt more adaptive forms of regulation so that regulation isn't something that happens 30 years after a new technology is invented in one fell swoop with whatever you know, good sides the regulation has and whatever bad sides, but something that involves much more of a testing and iterative approach as new technologies are being rolled out. So that's the architecture of the book. Thanks so much for being with us. Sarah will open to some of your questions and really look forward to hearing from all of you as well. Awesome. Yeah, to kick us off, um, one of the parts of the book that, that really stood out to me, you talk a lot about the sort of close relationship between Stanford, VCs in the area, and companies in the area. And there was one phrase you said it's an inward looking and self reinforcing system whose values become more detached from everyone outside it. I think it's what we sort of call the Stanford bubble. Um, what are your thoughts on how we get outside of that? You know, if we are supposed to be part of these conversations, engaging in them, but we're sort of here in this space, how do we bridge that and reach the outside world? Yeah, maybe I'll start. Because um, I'm part of that bubble, right? I mean, part, I'm a limited partner in a bunch of VC funds. Um, and, and part of my role in the CS department is actually bringing in VCs who taught classes for us. And I don't think that there's inherently anything wrong with that. I do think the issue becomes one of if that becomes your entire reality. Right, and so in this place, we are physically isolated from kind of what's going on in the rest of the world. There are people who will come here for a degree who will never go and spend an afternoon in East Palo Alto, right? And part of understanding who's impacted by technology and the way they're impacted is going and spending time with those folks. And the number of times I see students, for example, who are like, oh, we're, we're doing our user research. Well, who are you doing re user research on? Probably the kids in my dorm. <laughs> right, because they're convenient, they're who's there. And it's like, well, does that give you any insight about what's going on in the rest of the world? Does it give you insight about the people who you're not designing for, who are going to get impacted by this technology? Those are the things that, you know, the systematic drivers blend into, because when there is this race for scale, when there is this race to try to get something just out there, these other things get ignored and we stay in the mold. And so I think the biggest thing is to understand from a broader perspective who's actually impacted by the technology and understand that by designing for someone, that means there's other people you're not designing for. And that doesn't mean that your technology becomes neutral to them. Your technology may impact them. When you design a gig economy service for drivers, you're not just designing something for the people who are the customers who are getting rides. You're designing something that's impacting cab drivers and will impact a bunch of other people in that service industry as well. So understanding the bigger ecosystem, and that means being able to leave campus and go talk to people and spend time with them is a great part. I like to share an anecdote from the first time we taught, you know, our undergraduate course where one of the questions were in front of a room of 300 people and we engaged in a very interactive style. And, you know, I asked the question of, of the audience, uh, who is technology designed for? You know, and a very earnest student, you know, raises her hand and says, human beings, right? And I say, all human beings? All human beings. And then I start to name particular kinds of human beings, like most obviously the kinds of human beings who don't have access to the internet, don't have access to these technologies who live in very different environments. And then the answer was, well, maybe not all human beings, right? Um, or a follow-up question was, how do you think about the public interest? What is the public interest? And Another student raises her hand and says, the public interest, uh, I'm a member of the public, so what's in my interest is the public interest. And I think these are just reflections of this bubble that we, we exist in. And part of what we engage in chapter three of the book, which is really a robust defense of democracy as the context in which to referee these value trade-offs, is to take ownership of what the alternative is to engaging on these issues democratically. 
The alternative to engaging on these issues democratically is technocracy, right? And we should call it what it is. There are forms of technocracy that are ruled by the technology, right? That's the approach that we've had to the governance of tech over the last couple decades, right? Let the decisions be made by, by corporate you know, leaders, right? And the, and the folks who fund them, right? And we're experiencing a lot of the harms of that reliance on that technocracy. But there's an alternative version of technocracy, which is rule of elites, right? Rule of elites. People who are educated at places like Stanford, right? And let's, whether they're in a company or whether in the public sector, let's rely on those who are educated, who understand what these technologies are. And as Maron is describing, a lot of voices get missed in that process. And so ultimately, you know, from where I sit, part of the challenge is how we educate ourselves in these environments. But part of the challenge is also what all of you do when you go into a company, what all of you do when you go into a venture capital firm. How many of you are planning to spend part of your career in the public sector? Thinking about the public sector or the set of institutions that are designated to think about the social interest and the collective interest. Do you see bringing your talent to the table in that context? That's what I say to our undergraduates because most of them have never thought that they would bring their technical talent into government because their perspective on government is that it's slow, it's broken. One student said out loud in a case study discussion, government is where you go if you wanna show up at 10 and leave at three, right? With no substantive understanding of actually who is attracted to work in government and what is on the table for government to address. And so when we are dissatisfied with the outcomes that government generates for us, that's on us, that's not on government. That's on our failure to invest either as citizens or professionals in making sure that that technology that we have to referee value trade-offs works to achieve the social outcomes that we want. Okay, thank you. One more before we, uh, before we open it up. Um, thinking about policy and, and sort of the government level, I think we think a lot about the US government in relation to how, how that regulates tech companies. And I think they have a lot of power because so many of the tech companies are located here. The EU also has a certain amount of power, but you know, there's, millions, billions of people in, in other countries um, whose governments don't have as much say. How do we think about including those government voices in this discussion and to what extent should it be more international government looking at some of these issues versus national? I'm gonna throw it over to the guy who used to work at the UN. <laughs> um, so this is a question that, that actually has come up a lot in, in our sort of experience of, of rolling out the book. And, and I like very much the spirit of what it comes from which is a notion that the impacts of technology on people's lives are not concentrated in the United States, are not concentrated in the global North. They're spread all around the world. Yet the most consequential discussions that are being had about how to regulate tech are happening either in the EU with the use of its extraterritorial kind of powers of legislation to shape the incentives of companies here and now in Washington, D.C. And so it's natural when you notice that disconnect to say, well, why aren't we having global conversations about tech regulation? Um, and of course, as someone who spent an important part of my career in the UN system, I have a sense of what those global conversations look like, right? They're a race to the bottom. They're lowest common denominator politics. They are not infused with some of the values that we in the United States think are important, right? Including freedom of association, freedom of expression, right? And so when, when you think about the architecting of global standards and global policies, the way that things have unfolded since 1945 is a pathway through which the US legislates and we then internationalize, you know, sort of domestic legislation. You know, and this is how you get global protections for people with disabilities, right? As, as just one model of, of sort of the uh, export of, of a set of US laws and policies. But of course that then creates a really consequential challenge, which is how in the context of the US policymaking process, do we make sure that voices outside of the US and the concerns of those voices actually shape the policy choices that are being made? And I think, you know, partly what you're seeing with the Facebook papers, and we haven't yet mentioned Francis Haugen and, and the extraordinary whistleblowing that was done to shed light on, on sort of what was being weighed in Facebook, there's increasingly attention and awareness of the, the, the corporate decisions and the harms that are experienced in countries that have entirely different contexts 
than in the US uh, economic or political environment. And so we need a policy making process in the United States that is attentive not just to American concerns, but to these broader issues around human rights and autonomy and human well being. Um, and we need citizens in the United States, but also you know, activists in the United States to create space for these international voices. But we're not going to see movement on international standards until there is movement in the United States. And of course, that's the challenge that the EU has confronted up until the current moment. The EU would like to coordinate in very important ways with the United States to set common regulatory standards, but has had no partner in the United States. And so I think we're not gonna be able to open up that global conversation until we have movement out of Washington, but I feel optimistic that we're on the verge of movement out of Washington, which will enable more global conversations to proceed. Great, All right, I think we can open it up to two questions. Hi, thank you so much for being with us. Um, so last week, thanks to our awesome professors, some folks in this room were in here talking with some people from Facebook. We had a really interesting conversation and I was just struck by the impression that the two folks we were hearing from were extremely well-intentioned, thoughtful people uh, who had to put on blinders to a lot of what was happening within Facebook. They said explicitly to us, like we're policy people, we don't think about growth. Um, we think about this, we don't think about that. And then I think they need to do that too be focused and to keep themselves sane was my sense. And so I'm curious, I'm someone coming from startups and I've been interested in working in big tech, but you know, obviously you have Francis Haugen is one extreme of how you can make a difference going into big tech and then becoming a whistleblower, but it much more likely seems like most folks will become more like the people we saw from Facebook where you kind of put blinders on and you work within your lane and you do like local maxima to make an impact, but it really made me question whether that can be truly a meaningful path in the context of everything that you said. On the other hand, we do have all these concerns about working in government, which you stated, and I expect that people we heard from Facebook believe they're making the biggest impact because their product is so much scope. So how would you suggest that folks like us think about being in big tech? Do you think it's possible to make a true impact there? Or do you think we should just be considering more of these sort of systemic roles in government, other things like this? So start. Um, I think there's rules in both. I mean, we have students ask all the time in our class, you know, now that I see some of the harms or I understand these issues or I had even had concerns before the class, should I not go work in a big tech company? Uh, and the response I would give them is, well, if you don't and you're concerned about these issues, who's left to go there, right? And people are not concerned about these issues. So I do think there's a role to be played in the company by well-meaning people. The important thing is when you get there is not just to become another thing that helps drive the systematic driver. I think that's what happens. People get into companies, they get their set of, you know, whatever their performance indicators are, and your career is based on that, right? So they're like, hey, you know what? If you grow ads by one-tenth of one percent, that adds a hundred million dollars to our bottom line. That's a great career path for you. And what it takes is someone to say, you know what? Maybe the thing that matters is not just measuring how we pick up the use of the click-through rate on ads, but maybe there are some other things we need to bring into that KPI or OKR equation to understand what the company should actually be thinking about from a broader scale. So I do think there's opportunities for people inside the company to be able to turn some of these knobs. But the important thing is to understand what some of the alternatives might be, make compelling arguments to try to push the company in the right direction. But I don't think that alone is gonna solve the problem. And I, I was at Google for the better part of a decade. I have tons of friends who work at all these companies who are wonderful, well-meaning people. At night, they go home and play with their kids. You don't have to call Child Protective Services, right? They're really nice people. But the problem is they are part of a machine where those blinders get put on them because they come into work and there's the thing in front of them that they're trying to optimize. And they believe that, well, I focus on this. Someone else is focusing on this other thing. And so I don't worry about it. And what that does in a company is it turns the issue of ethics and trying to actually understand the broader scope into an issue of legal compliance, right? So, oh, well, I'm working on this thing. If there's an ethical issue, the chief ethics officer will deal with that. That's the worst thing you can do, right? I'm going to have one person in a company that deals with all of the ethical issues that can't possibly know everything that's going on. And that person's probably trained in the law or has a team of lawyers around them to make sure that what they're doing can be legally justified. That's not about ethics. You might as well just call that a compliance team because that's really what's going on. And so part of the notion is Jeremy alluded to is how do you infuse at a very broad scope in these companies 
that notion of thinking about there is a broader set of stuff that we want to care about that we really think the company should be focused on, right? And you see in some ways that it reaches a tipping point, right? It reaches a boiling point. People walk out at the company and say, we don't like this policy. We've tried to talk about it. It's gotten to a point where no one's hearing us and we're going to walk out. And we're going to see more of those things unless we actually see companies take some steps. But the one thing I would add on top of that is I mentioned at the beginning, it's not a story of good people and bad people. And the way I think about that is, you know, they're spending a lot of time with Jeremy and Rob. They were right. There was a bunch of like policy and philosophy stuff I had to read. And it's the best thing about being a professor is you're also a student all the time. But it's kind of the pseudo Rawlsian approach of thinking about governance in a company. So I shouldn't have to rely on the fact that I have friends in the executive staff of a company for them to do the right thing. If there was a set of regulation that was what collectively we think is the right thing, and that's something that the company happened to do by itself, that's great. If they happen to do by itself, then it doesn't matter if those guardrails are in place because they're doing the right thing anyway. But what I want is the safeguard to say that if you replace the executive staff with people who are diametrically opposed to the kinds of things I or us collectively believed in, those guardrails would be in place to prevent them from doing the bad thing. Right? So it doesn't matter if they're good or bad. What we should agree on is there are some set of standards and guardrails we want to have. And those happen, those are in place for whoever's leading the company, right? Whether they stay within those guardrails or want to try to move out them, there's actually a reason why they get moved back in. But the way we get those guardrails is through democracy until we get there is through actually people in the company making a difference for pushing for what they think is right, at least from my personal point. Just two, two, two quick additions. Number one is this whole idea that just because the effects weren't intended, somehow people are off the hook, like just doesn't even resonate with me, yet you constantly hear it from people in tech companies. Like we didn't intend to cause all of this social harm. So somehow it justifies you know, the outcome. It's like companies are responsible for these social harms. We exist in a context in which the social harms are realized. But we have an absence of political leadership to bring accountability, right? And so you're either going to get reputational costs on the companies via, you know, sort of how people think about these social harms in the broader consumer space, or you're going to get government that comes along and, and sort of attempts to internalize the costs of these social harms. But just because people have good intentions doesn't mean that they somehow don't are absolved of responsibility for what comes from the technologies that they build. The second thing just to say, and this is the biggest lesson that I take from the, the Francis Haugen papers, is that Facebook was really diligent about building an extraordinary research capability and a set of expert teams that helped them understand the harms of their technologies and some of the choices that they might confront. But those people had no power or influence. And if you build a structure in your company where you basically take that enterprise and organize the set of people who, as you said, We'll sort of walk around with the blinders and you're here to do the good thing, but you don't actually have any power or influence. Those folks have an option, which is to exit, right? And they can exit and just, you know, leave with a check. Or if they're really principled, they can exit in the way that Francis Haugen exited, right? And call out the lie that was Facebook's at least expression that it didn't know what potential harms it was causing. A far better model, right, is the integration of these considerations into your product design process, into your engineering process, where it's the responsible of everyone in the company to think about your North Star, to think about the core values, to deal explicitly with the trade-offs, to attempt to forecast social harms that might go beyond the, the harms of a particular user of your product, and to think about what is the company's orientation toward addressing those harms, either through the technology you design or the positions that your company takes in support of regulation, in support of governmental response. That's what you really need to avoid you know, the outcome that we saw in Facebook, and also to create a space in which someone like you sees a, a deliberate and intentional reflection on these issues in the corporate model. Thank you. I'll take one of the online ones. Oh, this is not an online one. Not online. Sorry. We'll take Matt. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. Uh, my name is Matt. I actually work in Alphabet in our corporate development team this summer. Um, so this feels very resonant. My question is more is around kind of a solution oriented. The cause and effect is uh, enormous organizations like Alphabet and et cetera are often really hard to determine. You've talked about kind of embedding the research component within the product team. 
Um, but I'm wondering, like, let's let's say that once that information becomes relevant, who are the people that should be making those decisions? It's not immediately apparent to me how you go from like a company-wide decision to a more democratic process where the users are making decisions about about that. Can you talk a little bit more about how it goes from the information being available to a clear-cut decision or, or a decision of some kind that we should be making? So I think you know the question of where decision-making power should be vested on all of these issues is one of the most complex questions that we confront. And there is no right answer to that question, right? That's basically a political judgment. It's about the legitimacy of the decisions that are being made that affect all of us. And so the example that, that Maron gave of, our, of Signal and WhatsApp, right? And Apple, of course, you know, minimizes you know, you know, is concerned with data minimization, right? So putting a finger on the scale for the protection of people's privacy. And of course, inside a corporation, a, a company can decide that it cares a lot about privacy, right? DuckDuckGo is on NPR every morning telling me how much it's concerned with my privacy. Um, and it's great that we have a market that offers me that alternative. The challenge with something like Signal or WhatsApp we're thinking about Apple's debates about you know breaking into the iPhone around terrorism mm -hmm. and threats to terrorism in the in the you know mid 2010 period, um, you know, or when that decision that a company makes has implications for the rest of us, right? In a way that might be in tension with other things that we value. In that case, personal safety or the effort, at least in you know with iPhotos and other things, to think about the transmission of child pornography. And the like, and so Apple finds itself in a in a situation where its corporate decisions are insufficient on their own to deal with a set of broader societal implications or social effects, and that's where you turn to government. Government enables you and our democratic process to referee some of those value trade offs, right? And so the debate that was unfolding around the iPhone in 2014, 2015 you know, when the FBI and others were interested in trying to prevent terrorist attacks and went to court to kind of referee these value trade-offs and to say that putting a, a thumb on the scale for end-to-end -end encryption or for unbreakable iPhones, like just wasn't going to work given the interests of government. And that was ultimately going to be refereed in the courts or politically and legislatively. And so if you know that the legitimacy of this decision-making it affords enormous power to companies to make choices about what they build and to roll out products to market, but that ultimately social effects are going to be observed in the world and people are gonna to look to companies and say, why are you responsible for those social effects? And government may play a role in shaping what the response is to those social harms as we see with pollution or other things. What then is the obligation of the company to decide itself whether it wants to mitigate some of those harms in design, that is trade-off growth, versus protecting young people in your social media platform. That's a choice that companies can make and legitimately make, right? Or, you know, be prepared to think about what the political response is to the choices that you made and engage constructively in that context. I don't think there's one right answer to these questions, uh, but ultimately, you know, I think our view is that companies need to lean in to making explicit rather than implicit the values that are being traded off and encoded in technology and to think just as seriously about their design choices as what, as what they would like to be the social responses to these consequences. So not just to say, I'm for regulation as Facebook says on my phone every day, right. but like then when they're brought up to the Hill and you know, one of the senators says, what regulation are you for? Well, we need to study that, right? So it's not, it's not serious. It's just, it's a PR point. Yeah, I guess maybe to add to that, it, it could take a one step further, but I think you know, the notion of um, regulation without information is going to lead to bad regulation. And the notion of information locked within companies is going to lead to a greater desire for regulation that will probably be bad regulation unless can be released. And so it's not like some of these things are mysteries of companies. Let me give you an example. Sridhar Ramaswamy, who was head of Ed at Alphabet, right, or at the Google part of Alphabet, left to go create Neva which is a subscription-based search engine that doesn't gather your data. And part of his motivation was he understood how much data was being gathered and how it was being used at Google. And that made him feel uncomfortable. I'm sure there's other motivations for starting a company as well, but that's, if you're basing your whole business model on that, you better have some belief that that's something that users are uncomfortable with. 
So it's not like this was an unknown thing inside the company. Well, part of it is if that becomes the mantra that the or the path the company continues to go down, and there isn't data available for regulators to understand what's going on over there, there's probably going to be some legislation that's proposed to rein in the power of that company that's probably not going to be fully baked in some sense or understand what's going on. But Google has no interest in releasing a bunch of their internal data. Facebook had no interest in releasing any of the stuff that Francis Haugen brought to light. But unless we actually have more of that communication, right, unless there's ways where you can say there's these things, like if we want regulation, oh, we need to study that more. Well, guess who has the data to actually study it? And you don't want the studies to be done internally at the company by themselves because then they get colored all kinds of ways. Right. Why not actually allow external, you know, you can have processes to vet people, external researchers to get access to that data, to be able to run the studies themselves that they care about and be able to report that both to the company and to regulators. Then you get regulation that's informed by what's actually going on. You get people who are from the outside, not even resources of the company, helping the company understand what's going on. And you get to a better understanding of how do we move forward to mitigate some of the harm. But that doesn't happen now because the companies keep their arms around the data. The only way it gets out is when there's leaks. And what we're left with is regulation that's trying to find some inroads to deal with these problems and doesn't have any access to, for data to be able to actually do something that's really useful. Yeah. Um, thank you both so much for this um, riveting debate, something that uh, we've spent a lot of time in class uh, talking about. I'm interested in particular, uh, Jeremy, to your point around uh, public service pipelines. I was in the United Nations for seven years before coming to GSB, um, next door to uh, where you were in the mission, um, and got to work a little bit on some of the early anemic attempts uh, <laughs> considering what digital cooperation, as the SD called it, might look like. I think everyone that I worked with or that I saw in that team was being coached by Big Tech the whole time. Um, myself included, I didn't go, but I'm here at the GSB, which says something. Um, so what would you, if you had a kind of magic wand to build in that pipeline, even if it was just from Stanford, what would it look like to get folks with the capacity and understanding not just into public service, but also to stay there? And what do you think those incentive structures on the public sector side need to look like? Gosh, that's such a, uh, an important question, but also a hard question to answer because we're dealing with archaic, you know, institutions that are not in a position to identify talent, promote talent, remunerate talent in a way that can attract, you know, the best and brightest, especially the best and brightest in technology. You, know, you think, you know, we there's this this is an undergrad kind of thing, but there's this thing called CS plus social good. It was created by undergraduates. The idea that you can be a computer scientist and also care about social good. And I once interviewed you know, the sort of leadership of CS plus social good to find out how things were going. And they said, we have tons of freshmen, right? Who show up. The problem is they don't bring a lot of skills. So we're doing a lot of websites for nonprofits and other things. But after freshman year, when they do their first internship in Alphabet or Palantir or something, and they're offered $20,000 for their summer, you know, and all sorts of benefits. Then we have a really hard time. By senior year, we have a couple key people who are still committed, right, who are public interest oriented people, but we've mostly lost everyone at that point. And that's the dynamic that we're playing with, you know, more broadly in, in this environment. And I think public service doesn't pay the way that the private sector does. So, you know, I think for me, I, I see a couple ingredients. Some are just mindset ingredients, and then some are institutional ingredients. So, so the first is, I want to awaken people to the moral dilemmas that they confront in their own choices about how to deploy their skills and talents. And the reason that that's so important is that that hasn't been a part of a technologist education in any serious way. And technology companies have sold themselves, as I said at the outset, as being the place where you can get rich and change the world for the better, no consequences, no harms, no one is hurt, right? And so that's the world that we've been in, and we have to bust open that mindset, okay? The second thing that we need to do is we need to create dedicated pathways for young people to experience what it means to work in the public interest, so that once you are awakened to these realities, 
once you are awakened to who is in a legitimate position to think about algorithmic bias or due process around the use of algorithms or how to think about the regulation of speech online, and you understand that it shouldn't be up just to Mark Zuckerberg on his own to make these decisions, but we need credible, legitimate institutions that speak for a broader group of people. And we need to create pathways for undergraduates, for business school students, others into these kinds of organizations. And then third, we need to think about an overhaul you know, of our federal civil service structure, right? And, you know, and, and we have less than 5% of the US federal service is under the age of 35, okay? So we are at a moment where we are going to experience a massive wave of retirement. And we need as dedicated an orientation to the overhauling of the federal civil service, the pathways in, right? Um, the compensation structure, the ability to promote talent, right? As we have thinking about the effective functioning of our private sector. And if we don't have that, it's because we're not demanding it, right? We're not expecting our politicians to deliver on that. In the United States, we have optimized for small and incompetent government. Right? That is the, the recipe of our politics you know, since the 1980s. And then we complain that government doesn't do anything or that government doesn't do anything well. Well, we've enabled that to happen. That, that doesn't need to be the way that government is structured. And so we have a lot of work before us, but there are whole communities of people from the creation of the US Digital Service to the Public Interest Technology Consortium among universities, all of which are focused on creating these pathways and pipelines. Um, and so it begins with awakening, and then it begins with pathways and experiences that explode these myths about what it means to work in the private sector and do good and get rich and work in the public sector and be poor and not actually have to go to work. Um, we need to explode these myths, and then we need to overhaul these institutions so that technical expertise um, you know, can really be deployed on behalf of the public interest in a way that people feel rewarded by, it, which I think we see in a lot of our students the desire for that. But the pathways aren't yet there. Great, sorry, I moved on. <laughs> um, I think we maybe have time for one more super quick question. If anybody has a rapid one, okay. I'll try to make it quickly. <laughs> um, two part question. I want to go back to root cause. You talked about people not serving, and yet the people who led Silicon Valley when I was in the commercial sector did serve. Hewlett Packard, Bob Noyce, they went and served in Democratic and Republican administrations because they were called to do so. The question, my first part of this is what has changed? Secondly, aside from the venture capital industrial complex, Marion, that you and I are a part of, how much of this cause is because of what's happened here at Stanford and other higher education institutions? We've basically become trade schools. It's about getting people jobs as opposed to teaching more broadly the issues that have vexed our species since the beginning of time that we have purged out of our education, in particular for undergrads. I'd like to know your opinions on those two things. So I'll just continue the riff that I was on here, which is to say, I think we've optimized for small and incompetent government. And in optimizing for small and incompetent government, um, you know, which is which is what's unfolded at least in U.S. politics over the last, you know, two three decades and a half. 150 years. Go back to the Federalist Papers. Madison J. Hamilton designed a government that was supposed to be small and ineffective. That didn't start in the 80s. I mean, you know, I, I think the disparagement of the public service ethos mm -hmm. that we've seen unfold over the last, you know, 30, 35 years is quite different in kind than the decision to create institutions, democratic institutions that have multiple checks and balances and are deliberate and slow and have their power constrained. I think those are two different things, right? You, you suggested that they're the same. I don't think that they are the same. Right, And so, yes, we had a set of strategic choices dating back to the founding moment, which is why we reflect on democracy in the book through the lens of guardrails. Democracy is not designed for disruption. It's not designed for speed. It's designed for intentional deliberation around competing preferences. And the decisions of the founders in the United States was to build a robust structure for doing that that didn't concentrate too much power in any single branch. But the rejection of the public interest ethos, right, and the privileging of a private sector mission as the only place in which you could do good or benefit people, et cetera, and, and you know, the communication of a total disrespect 
for those who do pursue the public interest mission, which is what we've had over the last 35 years, I think has done a real disservice. I'd also say that at least in the United States, and we can think about it in other comparative contexts, the capturing of our public sector by private money, the sort of selection into politics, who goes into politics, all of these issues have also further made it seem that even people with that core public interest motivation don't want anything to do with politics. So when Silicon Valley comes along and says, you don't even have to move to Washington, DC. You can affect the world. You can benefit everyone. You can hike on the Pacific coast on the weekends, right? And do incredibly well. I think that's why we saw, I mean, there were no students in social science anymore when I came back in 2015. It all moved over to computer science. Um, and it's because they had bought hook, line, and sinker, this orientation. You know, the thing I would add is I think one of the big things that changed, I mean, two things. One is we didn't have a major world war. I think there was a context for that, for the way the Cuba impact was gotten involved. But the second thing I think, part, and it's partly related to that, I'm not saying we need to have a world war to get back to it, is we've seen a focus probably for the last 40 years, probably starting heavily in the 80s, early 80s, on a focus on the individual. So, and that permeates high tech in a huge way, right? We have a cult of founders, right? Two people don't create a whole company. They start off, you know, building some technology, but then they bring other people together. And really to build a great company, you need hundreds or thousands of people to do it, right? But what do we do? We idealize the founders. What do we do in terms of compensation? We concentrate it in a few people. So if you look at that concentration on the individuals, who gets the benefits, who reaps the rewards, how we set up compensation structures, and then the fact that at the same time, on from a regulatory environment, we've done things like have much less progressive taxes for redistribution of wealth. Really what we've gotten 40 years is the cult of me. And I think that's what places like Stanford very much lend themselves to is the cult of me, right? You're special because you got here. And you are, I don't wanna take anything away from individuals. But just because you're special that you got here doesn't mean that the only reason you're here is for you. And unless we take a broader view of why we're actually here and the impact we can have, the responsibility we have for being here because we have so much more opportunity than the people who didn't get here means we have more responsibility to actually help more broadly when we leave this place. Thank you. I know we had a few more questions. I think we do need to wrap up there because some people have class. Uh, I'll just quickly mention we have another event tomorrow, Corporations, Governments, and Cybersecurity with Nicole Perloff, and one more on Friday, Spreading Digital Opportunities with Representative Rokana. Join me in thanking our speakers.